Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. How about a stout round table, big enough for your kitchen or even your dining room, with a built-in turntable, or a carousel as they call it in Georgia, right in the center, made out of antique timber. That sounds like it's something you'd like to have. I'll show you how to build it next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Well, today we are in the low country of Georgia. Low country because we're only inches above the water here, which is not far from the intercoastal waterway. And you see all the marshes beyond. Now, the owner of this house, a friend of mine, has graciously allowed me to come in and show you a table that she thought you might be interested in. I happen to love it. They call it a Lazy Susan table, for obvious reasons. Now, it was built in 1830 in Charleston, South Carolina, and it was purchased locally right here in Savannah. Now, the spindle for the Lazy Susan just turns inside this cup, which sits on top of these stretchers, which are half-lapped in the middle, and then tied into these turned legs. Now, if you happen to not want to use the Lazy Susan, you can easily remove it. And you would cover the hole with a plate or, or maybe a pot of flowers. Now, this is a perfect project for some of our antique pine. And just imagine what it would be like with your family sitting around this table. Well, what do you think? Here's our version of that antique carousel table. I built mine out of recycled pine. I've actually already applied one coat of a polyurethane that has a stain in it, and it really brings out the character of that old pine. The diameter of the main table is exactly the same as the antique original, but I made the carousel a bit smaller. Our design department thinks we should go back to the original size, which is a little bit bigger. But hey, you can make it any size you want. If you'd like to build the carousel table, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. The antique timbers that I used to build the prototype started out looking like this, boards salvaged from an old renovation. The objective is to make them smooth and uniform in thickness. We have a new machine to do that. In the past, you've seen me recondition these timbers with a surface planer. But grit on the boards and maybe a stray nail does a job on the planer knives. And I'm limited to width. At the present time, I only have a 13-inch surface planer. Here's an alternative, a drum sander that'll take 24-inch boards. The conveyor belt here runs the material through the machine, and the whole bed can go up and down, giving me a range of 0 to 12 inches. There's also an electronic readout, which gives me very accurate settings for the thickness. And underneath this hood is where all the work takes place. There are two drums, and you can outfit them with all different types of sandpaper, even put the same sandpaper on both of the drums. I'm starting here with 36 grit, finishing off with 50 grit on a drum that's just slightly lower to start to smooth the board. Because this is a sanding operation, you make a lot of fine dust. So you need really good dust collection. Now, a surface planer, you can take off a 16th, even sometimes an eighth of an inch at a pass. With this, you should really only take about a 64th. But with patience, it does a good job. Now, before we use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. That's a pretty good job, and no knives to change. Now I'll just flip it over and do the other side. Well, after a couple hours at the drum sander, I have boards that are uniform in thickness and down to a grit of 150. There's enough here to build the entire table. 
These are the boards for the top. Now one of the things I like to do when I make large glue ups is alternate the grain patterns. Have one with the growth rings up, one down, one up, one down. And that gives some stability to the top. However, I found that when using recycled timber, you can't always do that because you only end up with one good side on the board. So you have to do the best you can. Before I can glue these together, I have to clean up the joints. They should fit snugly without any pressure. Best tool to do that is the joiner. I'm going to reinforce these joints with some biscuits and glue. But I want to make sure that the biscuits won't show through the edge when I cut the table top. So I've taken a scrap piece of wood and measured from a nail to the end, the radius of the table plus a quarter of an inch extra. And now I'm just going to scribe a line. And as long as I lay out the biscuits inside the line, they won't show. I'm putting a slot for a number 20 biscuit about every eight or nine inches. With a little glue in the slot and some on the edge of the board, I can install the biscuits. We found over the years that this type of joint is very strong. For the last few minutes, I've been making these square blanks from some more recycled pine and I'll turn these for the legs. Well, I am one lucky woodworker. I have this lathe duplicator attachment that goes on my lathe and allows me to make multiple copies of a turning quite easily. Now, let me show you how it works. I start out by making a hardboard template which has the profile that I want to turn cut into it. On the machine, there is a pin which follows the profile. And at the same time, up on the other end, there is a little cutter which actually cuts the wood. It's a lot like a key making machine. It's very accurate, it's very fast. The legs will be connected to one another with rails. And the connection between the rail and the leg is a mortise and tenon joint. I like to cut the mortises in the legs first. So I'm using my dedicated mortising machine. It's set up with a 3 8 inch mortise chisel. There's a drill bit in the center that removes the bulk of the material, then the chisel squares it up. And I just mortise from layout line to layout line. There's one more mortise that I need in each leg, and that's to receive the stretchers, which go diagonally across the table. And they're very important because they add strength to these thin pine legs, and they also create a resting point for the carousel axle. Let me show you how I'm going to locate that mortise. At the top of the leg, we have the mortise for each rail. Directly below the corner is where I want to locate the mortise for the stretcher. That means I have to hold the leg in a diagonal position, and that would be real hard to do freehand. So I brought out an old jig that I had in the shop that has a V-groove cut in it at a 45 degree angle. And I'm using a couple shims to make up the difference between the diameter and the square portion of the leg so that it's nice and flat. And when I sit it in there like that, I know the mortise is going to be in the perfect location. With the legs still in the jig, to hold it in the right position, I've now switched to my radial arm saw, which is set up with a stacked dado head cutter. And I've just created a bit of a flat spot right at the mortise area, because the stretcher, when it fits in, will have square shoulders. This way, I'm assured of a nice, tight joint. Well, now I'm ready to make the tenons on the ends of the rails. And this piece is a little bit unusual. The rails are meant to be perfectly flush with the face of the leg. That's the way the antique original was. And that's an unusual detail, because generally, the rail is held back a little bit, giving a reveal. The problem with putting the rail flush is that very little material will be left here if I center the tenon. So to give it more structural strength, I've moved the tenon to the inside of each rail. That makes this area thicker. And I really don't need a shoulder on this side, because I don't see this joint 
It's on the underside of the table. To make the tenon, I've set up a stop lock at the saw with the right distance for the shoulder and raised the height up for half the thickness of the rail. Now I can run the pieces through face side down. With the fence in the same position, but the blade raised to a half inch now, I can nibble away the top and bottom of each tenon. To complete each tenon, I have to make a cheek cut on one side. So I'm using my tenoning jig, which allows me to hold the board securely in place while I run it through the saw. The height of the saw is equal to the length of the tenon. Just run the pieces through. Let's take another look at the prototype. I'm going to tip it up so that you can see underneath the top. And you'll notice that I've attached the top to the base with some wooden clips. And those clips sit in a groove of each rail. I'm going to make that groove next at the router table. Now, I don't want the groove to go through the tenon because it'll weaken it. I want it to go from shoulder to shoulder. I've set up a 3 8 inch straight cutting bit, and I've transferred lines back to the fence for the leading and trailing edge. I just drop the piece in over the bit with the shoulder line on the pencil mark, push it through, and lift it off when it reaches the other shoulder. Now I'm ready to start forming the tenons on the ends of the stretchers. And that tenon will be centered because it goes into the round portion of the leg. The depth of the shoulder cut is 3 16 of an inch. The length of the tenon is the same as it was for the rails. Well, just as before, I complete each tenon by making the cheek cuts using my tenoning jig. Where the stretchers intersect, they're going to be joined by a half lap joint. And while the dado head cutter is still in the radial arm, I've clamped both pieces together and I'll just make the notch. That does it. One of the advantages of a mortise and tenon joint is that I have a lot of good glue surface areas to hold the joint together. With a good quality glue applied to both the mortise and the tenon, this joint is going to stay together for many years. Well, now let's see if we can get our stretcher into the first two mortises. Now, sometimes instead of trying to drive it home with the mallet, I'll put the clamp on it and see if I can just squeeze it together. That's good. Well, I think that's just about all that we'll do today. Tomorrow, we'll finish the top and build the Lazy Susan. This is a nice project. Well, good morning. I got started today gluing up a blank for the Lazy Susan. Same procedures as earlier. I sanded the board smooth and uniform in thickness, jointed the edges, installed biscuit slots and glue. Now I just have to clamp it up and let it cook. Well, now I'm ready to size the main tabletop, cut the circle. The first step is to make a quarter inch hole in the center of the blank for this dowel pin, which is going to act as a pivot point. Now I'm going to take the same dowel pin and install it on this extension that I've put on my band saw. The pin will be 27 inches from the blade, the radius of the table. Now I can bring the blank over, drop it on the pin, and spin it around, making the cut. Good. Here it goes right on the pin. That's all there is to it. Now, we'll just sand it smooth. To ease the edges on my top, I'm using a portion of a 3 8 inch radius roundover bit. Well, now I'm ready to secure the top to the base. You would think that the best way to do that would be to keep the grain of the boards of the top parallel to a couple of the rails. That actually presents a problem. 
When the grain is parallel, the top can flex. It makes it weak. But if I spin the base 45 degrees, mm. just like it was on the antique original, the grain comes at a 45 degree angle to the rails, adding much more strength. To secure the base to the top, I'm going to use some hardwood clips that I made, and they simply slip into the groove that I made earlier. I'll make those at the table saw. Here's a piece of scrap hardwood, a little bit longer than what I need. I've set the rip fence and the height of the saw blade so that I can nibble away a rabbit on each end, and then trim them to size at the miter box. There's two operations for the screw hole. First, a 3 16 through hole, then a countersink for the screw head. Now I'll just secure them with the screws. Never any glue. I want the top to be able to move. This would be a good time to cut the hole in the top for the axle of the turntable. First, I'm going to drill a pilot hole with a half inch spade bit, and then I'll finish it up with my jigsaw. Well, now I'm ready to start making the axle for the turntable. So I've mounted a piece of pine here in my lathe. I'm going to turn the top four inches to two and 15 sixteenths inches diameter, which is a sixteenth of an inch smaller than the hole I cut in the table top. Then I'm going to taper it down to an inch at the very bottom. About the only tool I need is my gouge. I brought back the prototype Lazy Susan so you can see how it's constructed. Off of the axle, there are four spokes that actually support the top. They are connected with a mortise and tenon joint. I want to make the mortises in the post first. To do that, I've cut a square block of wood that's exactly the same size as the top turning of the post. I'm using a drill bit to drop it down into the center left by the drive center of the lathe, and I'll just screw them in place. This will register the mortises 90 degrees to one another. Now I can show you how effective this jig is. I rest one side on the base and the other against the fence and make the first mortise. Now I simply spin it 90 degrees, set it in place, and make the next mortise. Spin it one more time. And the last one. Just as before, I'm using the radial arm and the stacked dado head cutter to create a flat spot for the shoulders of the tenon. Here are some pieces which are going to become the spokes for our turntable. I've just formed one of the tenons. I made shoulder cuts first, then I nibbled away the top of the tenon, and I've just completed each tenon by making the cheek cut. I'm using the same techniques I used earlier to make the other tenons. I want to taper each of the spokes from the full width to about 3 quarters of an inch. So I'm using my tapering jig. I set the piece against the stop and guide it through using a push stick. Here I'm using my sanding center to grind down a curve at the end of each spoke. Now, once again, I'm using my router with the 3 8 inch roundover bit to ease the edges of each spoke. There's no mechanical fasteners at all to put these spokes into the axle. Just a little bit of glue and a nice tight fit. 
Okay, now the next thing to do is to build a socket into which this axle will fit. We'll do that at the lathe. To make the socket, I started out with a piece of one and a quarter inch pine that I rough cut the diameter over at the bandsaw. Then I attached it to this plate with three screws and spun it onto the lathe shaft. The first job is to true up the edge, making it a perfect circle. I'm just using a small gouge. Okay, that's pretty good. Next thing I want to do is just round over this top corner. Okay, that's pretty good. Now I'm going to actually turn the tool rest so that it's parallel with the face. Move it up a little bit closer and start to scoop out the inside. Okay, that's pretty good. Now I'm going to start a second scoop out which will fit the tip of the axle. A little bit of glue on top of the stretchers. I'll clamp this in place, being sure that it's perfectly centered, and then attach it with a couple screws. These holes in the spokes will be used for screws to secure the top of the Lazy Susan. Okay, now we have a lazy Susan top. I'll sand it smooth and ease the edges just like I did with the tabletop. Once again, no glue, just screws. Well, let's check the fit. Pretty good. Spins just like a top. A little more final sanding, and this will be ready for the finish. For years, we've tried all different kinds of finishes on our antique pine. We've made our own stain. We've used wax that has stain in it. We've applied stain and then urethaned over it. But nothing has given us the look that's quite as good as this. This is a polyurethane that already has the stain in it. So I get a beautiful color with just the first coat. And it's not blocking up. It's nice and even. Here I can show you a couple things with our carousel table. Here's the turntable. It has one color coat and one clear coat. I didn't continue building up the finish with color coats because I was afraid that it would get too dark. Once the first clear coat had dried, I sanded the top. Between coats is necessary to do a light sanding with 220 grit paper, then vac the surface clean, and go over it with a tack cloth. Now I'm ready to apply the next clear coat. The reason I'm putting on multiple coats is because I want people to use this table and not be afraid that they're going to damage it. And with multiple coats of a tough finish like this, it's not going to happen. Well, I think we've found just the right finish for our antique pine. Brings out the beauty of the wood and it protects it. This was a fun project to build. <laughs>